Hey everybody, welcome to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. Good to see everybody's smiley faces. It's nice to have you with us, joining us on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, where we're bringing back the lost out of conversation with our celebrity friends and guests coming in from all around the world, from the worlds of Broadway, Hollywood, television, film, music, sports, comedy, culinary arts, inspiration, and so much more. I am your host, Jim Masters, and we're very excited because we have our viewers already commenting. I know they're really excited about the guests we have coming on the show. This is really a special episode we are doing because we have, yes, stars from Cosmic Radio, the fabulous film. Matter of fact, it's Academy Award winner Seymour Kessel's last film. Not only do we have one of the stars with us as well, we also have the producer and the writer-director joining us as well. And if you're not familiar with this really, really cool film, well, guess what? It's actually available for viewing now. You can actually see it. And it's amazing. It was uh, really part of this incredible sort of history that we're going to talk about a little bit. And it has been found. It thought They thought that this was actually long lost. And then they recently rediscovered it and it's been redistributed, which I think is fantastic. It premiered at the Palm Springs International Film Festival. They thought it was lost. It was recently found and remastered and it's an environmentally friendly rom-com, which is a romantic comedy in many different ways. And it's got a fantastic message to it as well. It follows the story of a countercultural culture radio station owner whose business is on the verge of going belly up along with the illusions that have fueled his life so far. When the daughter of a conservative senator comes to town, hoping to save the forest from being clear cut in the nearby mountains, sparking a political battle with uh, ramifications far beyond the concerns of the sleepy resort community of Idlewild, California, and its uh, small town citizens. And we have John Sekar with us. He is uh, one of the stars. We're also blessed to have on our show um, Stephen Savage. Now, Stephen is writer, director, and also Ryan R. Johnson, the producer of Cosmic Radio. They are joining us here as well on uh, the program. First, we actually have a little clip, a little trailer we're going to show you guys, and then we're going to talk about it as they're joining us from actually all over the country. They're not in the same spot, but we're going to have them join us in just a second. Here's a little preview of this fantastic film, Cosmic Radio. You're tuned to California's only true music station, Cosmic Radio. And if you've been anywhere near downtown today, you know things are definitely heating up. Man, you know, you told me to put her in the tree. She's in the tree. Can you manage to remember what happened in Humboldt? We don't need that crap here. It's the Free Earth Alliance. And these cats are serious when it comes down to the environment. Tree sitter Rachel Atwood, daughter of conservative Senator Charles Atwood, still hasn't said a word about her demand. Everybody's trying to get me to talk, and I'm offering you the big exclusive. As protests heat up in this once sleepy little community, all eyes are on local radio station KZMC, whose exclusive interview with tree sitter Rachel Atwood made national news this morning. I think she's awesome. We know you're just a kid. As you get older, you'll see that not everything is always so black and white. Your financial ties to the corporation are cut. You're out. Watch the flight of that ball, because that's you. David Vasquez, Pegasus Radio. That's satellite, right? Jesus Christ, this is an A-track. I want us to take these big speakers, put them under that girl's tree, blast her the hell out of them. Yeah, come on down, baby. I got a tree you can sit on. Every time you people have some judge that goes against you, you think that there's conspiracy. You know, the elders, they say that if you find a man who's lost his vision quest, you point him in the right direction. And look who we've got here. <laughs> we've got a full house in the house. Let's welcome Ryan Johnson, the producer. And uh, John is here, Sekar, one of the stars of Cosmic Radio, and Stephen Savage, writer and director. Gang, welcome to the show. It's good to have you guys here. Thanks for having us. Thanks, yeah. Chad. 
that's a really cool clip there. We have that little trailer and congratulations again. Uh, tell us a little, I, I mentioned just in the introduction, a little of the history of cosmic radio, but this was something that they thought everybody thought was not to be seen again, right? And it was recently discovered and is being redistributed and is available for viewing now. How did that all happen? That's a cool sort of trail of events. Well, it's like, uh, you know, I'll let Steve give a little bit of the background of the origins of it, but just to, to the to the lostness of it, it's like uh, we had finished it at a time when uh, there was massive flux going on in the, in the distribution space, and there was a company we originally had contracted with went away, and then we all, we, you know, we took a pause on the edit process and then off to go travel and do whatever other movies we were doing. Moved to the East Coast, and I'm saying, <laughs> as the marketplace got really healthy, just uh, per particularly now over the, over the pandemic, it was like, where's the movie? <laughs> and we were trying to find it, and Steve had some of the hard drives. We had a, a post gentleman who works for me, other things, had some of the drives, and we were able to kind of get back into it. And, but there was a there was definitely a panic there along the way, and we're just so excited that it's finally out there and the timing's right. I mean, it's a period, a little bit of a period piece. So it's very, it's evergreen anyway. And our cast yeah. is, is outstanding and all that good stuff. So it's like, uh, and then the, the timing being midwinter, it's a summer movie and it's fun and nostalgic. And anyway, so Steve, maybe go into where it all started. Yeah. I'd love to hear that. Uh, the great, germination right? of it all. It's great, Ryan. Right? It's tight because literally we all knew this was a special little film took it to a major film festival at Palm Springs where we premiered. And um, not only did we, we were the first film to sell out at that film festival because Hollywood was going green, right? When we made this and every story was about how everybody's dri now driving Priuses and all this stuff was happening. And then uh, um, it was just perfect timing for the film to, to come out. But what we've done now that there's been some years since we shot it and now it's being re-released uh, I, Ryan and I got together and talked about how do we make it work because you're looking at a film where everybody has, as I was saying to these two guys uh, a few days ago, everybody's got Blackberries. They're talking on Blackberries and flip phones and yes, it's all look old. And then Ryan and I said, well, why don't we just, there's a kid in the film, the actor, actress, Lauren Gregg, Greg, she, um, she's one of the focal points of the movie. We decided to take her voice now that she's a little older. Now she's grown up a little from when we made the movie, do a voiceover. So now it's just her reminiscing about this special summer that she had. And now it works on every level. So it's just a retro kind of film that could have been shot yesterday, but it wasn't. <laughs> and it, it. it has sort of like this cult following vibe to it i can see people really you know almost like rocky Howard picture show type of cult following it could really it has this following that is unique wouldn't you say yeah of course yeah it's got um it's got so many elements of the of a time <laughs> that we're probably not going to see anymore you know when i wrote the movie originally i was finishing film school I had gone to LA film school for a year and a half and it was expensive as hell. And so I had a girlfriend that wanted to move up. She inherited a ranch up in Idaho. So I decided to go up there. I went to um, Washington state to get my degree. And I worked at a radio station while I was <laughs> going to school. And I started getting the idea to write this movie. And while that was happening, Julia Butterfly Hill was climbing this tree and it was a big big anti-logging fight thing. That was the big thing of the late 90s into the early 2000s was the environment, the environment, the environment. Yes, right. I just wanted to write a comedy, you know, that had some more <laughs> to it. But all of a sudden this started sneaking into my head about the, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of a right wing guy in let, until it comes to the conservation of forests and stuff. Then yeah. I'm completely... I'm a, I'm just one of those guys, you know, I live yeah. in a national forest, believe it or not. And yeah, where are you? Where are you located? Idaho, California, which is where the movie takes. So place. that's, that is where, yeah. And one thing was about Ryan, first of all, Ryan and Jonathan have believed in this project since day one. You yeah. Know, they took a chance. This is my first, other than my thesis film, which was a college thing. This was my first uh, feature film outside of school. And to just hand me this budget. And not only that, 
Ryan and Shannon McCainian, our casting director, handed me this cast that was just unbelievable. Wes Studi, Irene Bedard, Ryder Strong. It's just, it went on, Seymour Casal, it went on and on every, and I was just like so, it was surreal. But from yeah. day one, Jonathan and Ryan kept this thing alive. And um, we went to Palm Springs. We were the darling of the film festival. And then it just kind of, things happened and it went away. Yeah, and they called me when Ryan called me up, and then Jonathan saying, "Dude, we're gonna we're gonna release the film." I'm going, "What?" <laughs> Another <laughs> like, moment coming yeah. out. It's um, you know, it's like, well, how is that happening? But it works on every level. It's definitely a retro film, but it works. It's just like if you're watching a, you know, The Lords of Flatbush or some movie about the '50s. It yeah. works on that level. So, yeah, I'm I'm just grateful to see it to see it out there. Jonathan, uh, being a part of it and like, uh, Steve said, you know, being so into the whole idea of it, what was it like having an opportunity to be a part of this, uh, of cosmic radio of this movie? Um, I, I really feel fortunate, especially looking back now, like sometimes you don't know what you have when you have it, you know? So when, when Ryan approached me and said, Hey, you know, we're making this movie, I uh, have a really great cast and I think, you know, you'd be really good for the, the lead role. And then I met Steven and he said, yeah, you know, he, he approved me. Um, I was, I was really surprised and happy, you know, because it was, I, I was doing some acting, but I was always doing smaller roles, supporting stuff. So to be able to have an opportunity to be a lead in a film, that alone was really special and, uh, you know, kind of humbling in a way. So I really appreciated that. But then the fact that the film was had a really nice message, you know, it's about pro environment, you know, saving the planet uh, forest, which I love. I mean, everyone, I think, enjoys being in nature and reconnecting to what's important in life. So then going up into Idlewild, California, which is in the top of a mountain, like yeah. above Palm Springs. Right. And it just takes a while to drive up that road. When you get up there, it's, it's just a beautiful spot really nice people cool little town um yeah so just to be able to be invited to be part of this was just really really special and then the fact like steven was saying the cast is amazing we had uh wes studi uh who was you know he's a, he's an academy award winner winner uh seymour cassell played my father and he's academy award nominated actor uh irene bedard who was the voice of pocahontas she was a love interest of mine just a beautiful person and a sweet sweet nice person and an incredible actress so i was just really fortunate you know um who else in it michael madsen was in it you know mike madsen from reservoir dogs and once upon a time in hollywood yeah he played the senator and you know beat me up and yelled at me and it, it was really cool <laughs> uh, it's, what was it's it? funny when John, jonathan talks about being cast in it and originally when i wrote it i hadn't met jonathan yet and i had a connection with um john corbett uh, the actor who did uh, Northern Exposure. Northern Exposure on CBS, I was, yeah. I had a connection there. So they invited me to, uh, he was, his band was playing at a casino. So I went there and I, I gave him the script and I said, yeah, just take a look at this. His agent got back to me the next day and goes, what are you crazy? This is, uh, he already did Northern Exposure where he played a disc jockey in a mountain. I think he, I think we'll pass him. <laughs> and I go, oh, shit. Well, and then I met Jonathan and now I'm watching the movie. I can't imagine the movie without Jonathan in that role. It just, oh, it just works perfect on every level. It's hey, funny. Steven, how, thank you, man. Thank you. It's funny <laughs> how you go full circle. You know, you have an idea in your head. Yeah. Things turn out like you're visioning, envisioning them at first, but they always turn out exactly as they're supposed to turn out. One of the uh, one of our viewers watching in Canada, Merlin had asked, "How did the name come about, Cosmic Radio?" Want to tell us about uh, that was the backstory on the name? That was just a whim, Cosmic K Z M C. That was it. it. Was I looked and I was online hoping there was no station called K Z M C. There wasn't, so I said, "Oh, that's good, Cosmic Radio." It's, it, there's no big history behind that or anything. It just kind of came to me while I was eating a 
Jumbo Jack or something. I don't know. It's just <laughs> so we uh, <laughs> we showed a little clip there with the trailer. Tell us a bit about it, as far as so it takes place at this. Uh, a lot of it involving this radio station, sort of an old school radio station, playing vinyl and sort of sticking true to form. And and I like that being in TV and radio myself. I sort of automatically was drawn in. Uh, tell us about that. Well, the radio station idea was the, because of the radio station I was working at just outside of uh, Spokane um, was just like that. We were playing vinyl. Yeah. We did have a lot of CDs, but we were playing vinyl. You're doing vinyl, yeah. yeah. There was stuff on the computer. Our playlist during the day was set up on a computer. But at night when my show was on, they just let, it was a classic rock station all day for the construction worker types. But at night I took over and it was more of a college radio station. We were playing Tori Amos and, and um, a, a whole lot of kind of alt bands, if you know what I mean. Um, Dead can dance and things like that. All those not late nineties kind of cool hip artists. And, yeah. uh, and the station was just like that. So we had a vinyl library and I just, I got a big kick out of it, but at the same time I was the only radio station I'd ever worked at. So to me, it was like, Oh, they're all like this. Hmm. But even then, when I wrote the wrote the screenplay, everything was pretty much digitized. I just happened to work at this station, and um, when we I went to some event where all of the radio stations in the area were coming together for some Christmas party or something, and people were making fun of our station, saying, ah, "You guys are still playing vinyl." You know? <laughs> I didn't know until that minute that that was freaky, that that was a weird phenomenon. So right. So from there. The antithesis of the story came about. Um, it just it, it was a goofy little radio station. And in the story, um, Ricardo Chavira from uh, Desperate Housewives, he plays a small a small role, but it's a very memorable role. And he comes from a satellite station, and he's doing the same to Jonathan's character. He's goofing on the radio station because it's so. Yeah, it was a perfect situation. We get a call from uh, his agent, and he goes, "Hey." Do you think you could fit Ricardo in the movie? He has the weekend off. Savage, <laughs> uh, can you write a roll real quick? And so it was totally based on that. Yeah. Okay. Brian, did, Brian did that. that a lot. Brian taught me a lot on that movie because Brian's <laughs> a, he's an adapt or die guy. So if he has an opportunity and there's a way to adapt anything to it, he goes to it. Now, me. As a newer filmmaker, I'm going, what are you talking about? We're doing a lighting change. I'm ready to direct a scene. And he throws a laptop at me. It's just right. Ricardo. <laughs> so I did. And thank God, because it's one of the, his characters, one of the highlights of the whole film. He's just, he's, he steals so much of the movie just because of his charm and personality. And, and uh, yeah. I, I think if I'd have had time to write that character, it wouldn't have come out as good. It was the urgency of it that made that everything work. And uh, yeah, that's Ryan though. Ryan is like, just do this. Don't ask questions. I, he told a story the other day that I'd forgotten, but we had set up lighting, our DP, Tarina Reed. We set up lighting for an outdoor scene between Michael Madsen and Jonathan and three hours to light it. Not just the lighting an outdoor night scene, but we had a crane shot coming into it. So it was a difficult shot. And Matson calls me over, Savage, come here. And I go over and he goes, yeah, I don't want to do this here. I want to do the scene over there. <laughs> so, again, Ryan just goes, just do it. So as with that scene, I'd read those two scenes I wrote for Ricardo. I just walked up to the DP. I didn't even stop. I just go, we're moving it to over there. And I walked away before she could throw it. Was, it was perfect because over it was like against the water tower instead of a wide open wash. And they had like a, a, a light that was affixed to it. And like, we're already lit. Yeah. <laughs> that is cool. Now, was it all filmed there at that same location, everything there, or were you in multiple locations, indoor, outdoor? Tell us about some of the locations and the setting for the actual. Well, it all was shot in Idaho, where I'm living now, where I have my house and my studio, um, which is just two hours outside of LA. It's not like it's in some foreign country or three, three, three hours. Well, three hours. <laughs> and then me and my child are I can the road for an hour. Yeah. I mean, but, uh, I think when most people think of Idlewild on East Coast, they think of the old Kennedy Airport. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still different, different yeah. vibe. Yeah. Yeah. So we shot the whole thing in Idlewild, except for some helicopter footage 
that uh, Ryan, in fact, was involved in. I'm not. I'm definitely afraid of heights. I don't dig open open door helicopters. Doesn't. Yeah. So he and the DP and a and a, a camera assistant went up and shot all the aerial stuff. So Ryan just was was second unit director that day, and they got some great stuff. Uh, you know, the big windmills outside, they're very iconic outside of Palm Springs. we got a bunch of that stuff. and and uh, But other than that, yeah, all shot in that one town. Wow. Yeah, and uh, one of the viewers uh, watching, uh, I believe, in South Africa, I think it was uh, Juanita, asking how long ago was the movie actually made? Uh, Ryan, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> I think our first day of shooting was in 2006, and we may have finished up in 2007. And uh, it was, I think Palm Springs, it, like the premiere was 08? 08, yeah. Yeah. We premiered in 08. Um, so, what is that, 14 years ago that the movie yeah, was? Yeah, a minute ago. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, not, it's not that unique in movie history. There are a lot of movies that have taken a long time to be. Sure, sure. So it's not, you know, people at home are going, oh, geez, that's a long time. But it happens. It just does. It happens. And particularly that era when a lot of the, the indie companies uh, went away and they all went into kind of bankruptcy. There's a ton of those movies that have never been released. And uh, right. so it does happen. We're at least nimble enough to just lose it for a second. And then we found it again. We're all good. But I think <laughs> when people see Cosmic Radio, they're going to wonder why it took so long. Just because of the cap. I mean, it's such an all-star cast. It's like every scene somebody walks on screen that you know them very well. You know, it's uh, so that's probably the biggest thing that people are going to wonder is why a movie with a cast like this took so long to release. But for me, as the director, I don't care. It's out now. Ryan just pulled pulled every string he could find to keep this thing alive, and now it's out. And um, you know. We've all done more movies. This is probably, I'm probably working on my sixth feature film right now since I made this. But this still, there's always going to be a special place in my heart for Cosmic Radio because this was my first movie. Absolutely right. Okay, now, I think one, one notable yeah. thing is that the movie was actually shot on film as a testament Which, to, to Ryan and, and Stephen because Super six it's, it's a lot harder to shoot something on film. Nowadays, everyone you know, has digital and they can – they can shoot for an hour straight on film. You have yeah. to reload the cameras and it's so, it, but it has that quality and that feeling to it. Now yeah. when you watch it, it's just so yeah. clear and crisp and there's and a drive it to a lab and wait for it to process. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Ryan, there's one thing I hate about cosmic radio watching it now after all these years is that it looks so beautiful. I want to start shooting film again. You want to go back to film, yeah. right? <laughs> the movie I'm shooting right now, we already started in London. We shot on the red, so we'll just continue. But next year, I have another feature. And I'm serious. I'm talking to my producers and about shooting on film, and they think I'm crazy. But it you can't. I was talking to Irene Bedard the other day about it. She said it looks, it's like comparing a, a watercolor to yeah. a digital print, you know, and it's, it is. Like, yes. This movie Let's, looks, uh, Let's talk about your individual backgrounds too, starting with you, Stephen. You were mentioning working on a multitude of other projects as well. Tell us about uh, your background a little bit and how did you get into uh, the film business? I was a musician for most of my, like, into my teens. And, teens. and then um, I, uh, we had a, my band had a recording deal with AM Records. We were the last band to sign with AM Records. And, um, we toured the world. We warmed up Foreigner and, you know, Molly Hatchet and a bunch of bands and uh, did that thing. And then that contract ended and they decided not to pick us up again. They sold out to somebody, Sony, I think, whatever they did. And then I moved to the UK for three years. But I always had film in the back of my head. I didn't realize yeah. as a kid I was studying movies, just watching them on TV. Yeah. Didn't think I was studying it. So when I'm in London with the, my girlfriend at the time, we went. they were shooting a movie there. And um, I just walked up to somebody and say, heck, how can I get a job? I don't even need to get paid here. I just want to kind of learn. And he, the guy I was talking to had a walkie talkie. So I assumed he was like the head honcho, but turned out he was just a PA. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he, he introduced me to, uh, he introduced me to the first AD. And the day I was, I was for free lugging sandbags around for the gaffers. <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> 
three days after that, they just said, Hey, we're going to put you on salary. We like having you around. And that, that was just a learning experience. That was, that was, uh, when I, I came back to the States and went straight to film school and knew I had the bug. And so that was, that was my background. And now, you know, even, uh, I own two film festivals, the Idlewild International Festival and the new uh, Scotland International Festival just outside Edinburgh. Mm. And I love film, independent film especially, just film that's done well but doesn't isn't necessarily locked in the studio or something like that. And so I try to stay. Of course, if somebody offered me a $20, $30 million movie tomorrow, of course I'd be happy, but it doesn't stop me. I, I can make those movies in – the one million to three million dollar range, I can make those look like huge movies, and that comes just like Ryan, I think, has that same background. It's because you have to; it's a necessity that you have to make a movie look great on a small budget that yeah. you get really good at it, and it actually helps you to get hired for a lot of things. Um, yes, right. It's and then you know, writing has always been a big thing for me. I'm at I'm on my third contract as a staff writer for Paramount right now, and I write a lot of spec scripts and things like that i don't care i don't need to be the main writer i just need to keep making movies it's yeah. like you know a guy that's turning 40 say and he's a major league baseball player and all he wants to do is just show up to the to the the ballpark and play every day you know? right doesn't exactly. care that's is a genre that uh, you lean towards that really speaks to you I sh I've shot a lot of Westerns, but that just comes from the fact that I have that. I'm a John Ford and uh, Sergio Leone nut. And so, yeah, so I know the genre. I know exactly what to steal. You know what I mean? <laughs> so as, yeah. <laughs> as John Ford said, you learn to steal from the best and you'll, you'll be successful. And right. uh, so, yeah, I know, but I, but I also like romantic comedy. Yeah. And then I have the movie I'm doing now that we're just has been on hold because of COVID yeah. is and a comedy but then after that i have these two sort of outdoorsy one is like an indiana jones kind of thing the other one is like a tarantino cop drama but they're big outdoor that's what i like is i like the outdoor stuff not the not the smaller kind of intimate films yeah exactly yeah how about you jonathan and i do have a question uh john is that a massive book or CD collection behind you on that There's wall. No <laughs> that is that, incredible. They're actually uh, negatives. Are they really? Photo negatives. They're books and books. There's like thousands of them in each folder of negatives for photographic prints from you know, photography. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I could uh, go <laughs> grab one <laughs> and open it up. But yeah, yeah they're incredible. negatives. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible! And you're in uh, you're in Cape May, yeah, New Cape May, New Jersey, which is the most southern tip of New Jersey, and they say that it's actually south of the Mason Dixon line. Wow, so it's weird that you're I could be in New Jersey, but actually part of the South. So, you're a, so you're a split personality. <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. But, so uh, what? It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's the oldest seashore resort town in the United States, and it's just a beautiful town with. You know, sand dunes and very rural and yes, it's a good, good place. Um, Maddie's watching Maddie Hogan and she goes, this is a question for all. What do you hope is the outcome will be in the long run following the release of cosmic radio? And Jonathan, do you still have that hair? <laughs> the hair that you have? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, uh, welcome. Yeah. Maddie I still have show. my hair. I, uh, I'm actually working on a movie right now called, uh, I think it's called Pretty Bird, and I play this guy out that lives out in the woods, yeah. and I'm pretty scruffy, and I yeah, I have my long hair. <laughs> Very cool. Mine's usually a lot shorter. Mine I just let grow during the pandemic for the heck of it. <laughs> you, 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 Jim, you and Jonathan could be brothers. You guys, I was going to say. I feel the well, same. Not basically yes, because you figure Long Island and then New mm -hmm. Jersey. The only thing that separated us was Manhattan. <laughs> that's about it <laughs> we know what it, we know what the diners are and the good pizza and the, the bagel fries. shops right john <laughs> oh yeah really good, good diners yeah. so how did you get started uh in entertainment and acting and you know, all john you know i i have a kind of a technical side to me so when i was in high school i was actually in the physics club and i love math and science and i always 
was making little videos with like my brother. We had like that old camcorder that you strapped over your shoulder and you had a, a camera that plugged into it with a cord and you had to be plugged into the wall. So we would, we would make little silly movies. And then I went to Tulane University and I was majoring in uh, mechanical engineering and I minored in theater because all my friends that were having fun were in the theater department and most of the engineering friends were not having so much fun. So I started doing plays in, uh, at Tulane University in New Orleans and I, I loved it. I had so much fun with it and I, did, I didn't really, I wasn't like desperate because it was just something I was doing for fun and I didn't really have to make a career out of it. Right. And I started getting acting roles in New Orleans, a lot of them, because I guess my accent, even though I'm from the north, it wasn't so strong like New York. Right. It wasn't so southern. So when movies like The Big Easy, or I did a movie called Tightrope, which got me into the uh, Screen Actors Guild. And I actually got to have a speaking part with Clint Eastwood. That's cool. And, uh, huh? So, wow. yeah, so I, I, I did that. And did all the commercials and stuff in New Orleans. And then when I graduated from, uh, from college, I went out to California. And uh, in between, I actually went to a uh, acting class out there called The Loft Studio with a, a guy named Bill Trailer mm. and a lady named Peggy Fury. And there was a lot of really good actors in there. Laura Dern was in my class. Um, a guy named Matt Lanzani that ended up going uh, meeting and marrying Olivia Newton-John and mm. a whole bunch of, you know, Chris Penn, Sean oh, Penn yeah. studied there. So it was really cool. Uh, what was it? Jason Gedrick was in my class who did Iron Eagles and everything. Oh, yeah. And uh, so, you know, so, but then I actually got into production. You know, I, I started doing music videos just to pay my bills. And I did some acting parts. And I did over 200 music videos with a, a company called Lime Life. <coughs> we did like the, uh, you know, all the, Tina Turner videos, George Michael, you know, uh, you know, just all the, all the big stuff. Michael Jackson, uh, David Bowie, and so I, I kind of like behind the scenes and then in front of the camera. So I just kind of stayed with it and just kept working in the industry. Yeah. Because it's amazing when you get to like a set and you, and especially in an independent world like with, like uh, Steve Savage was saying. Um, people they really care about what they're doing and they're not really there so much for the money. And it's yeah. just amazing the care that real artists have in their craft. Yeah. And, you know, so like I'm trying to be an actor and I'm taking my role seriously and I want to study my lines and make sure I'm prepared when I show up. But the people like in wardrobe, they're out, they're all night long. They're, they're doing things and they're making a thousand bucks a week. They're spending 2000 a week on their stuff. Like mm -hmm. they're not there for the money. They're like, they want everything to look great. And they care so much about like the way the buttons look, and, like things I would never even think about. So it's just a really cool vibe being a part of it. So I, I just like being around it either behind the scenes or you know in front. That's really cool. Other projects you have coming up in addition to obviously this uh, release of Cosmic Radio, other things you're working on, you're excited about? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff coming up. You know, I have a really cool movie called Shadowless. Um, uh, another one we're doing a big crime true story uh, that we're working on and yeah, a couple, couple big, big things. So, Very cool. Yeah. So we'll keep watching that, and we'll have you back too, maybe as a guest. Uh, all of you can come back on the show as yeah. guests. Ryan, uh, tell us about your prolific background too, as a producer and just being in the entertainment industry and the arts. Sure. Um, yeah, I always had wanted to be a producer since I was a little kid, and then came down to uh, L.A. on a baseball scholarship, and my first job was playing the stunt double for the uh, Power Rangers. I was the green one and got beat up a lot, which would be very good training going forward. And then uh, I was Sean Patrick Flannery's double. And then I got an internship with uh, uh, Mandalay Pictures right when they started for Peter Goober, who now owns the Dodgers and the Warriors. And uh, in sort of worked my way up from there, um, worked for the head of physical production, the head of creative, and then uh, we moved over to Paramount and those days was like wild things. And I know you did last summers and then Paramount, we did the score enemy at the gate, sleepy hollow and uh, into the blue. And then I, I left and started my own uh, production company and we did 18 movies in three and a half years and we a competition at Cannes and had some horror hits and, and uh, in on the tail end of that one, right when we got into this and, uh, and since then I did, you know, a hundred movies that, had 
fat man with Mel Gibson last year in Arkansas with Vince Vaughn and 12 Mighty Orphans that uh, we're happy with with Sony and uh, uh, have a long night of really creepy horror movie that comes out next week. And then, uh, and then uh, come back trail with De Niro and, and, uh, and uh, Tommy Lee Jones. And uh, the, that's coming out in another couple of months. So wow. lots of stuff. And, lots uh, of stuff, yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fun time in the business because the pandemic has really promoted uh, viewership. Like everybody's very hungry for their new content, whatever's brand new. Yes. So, Right. A lot of my distributor friends are very eager for me to get busy, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what I do. What was it like being a Power Ranger? Holy cow! <laughs> it was brutal. Yeah, it was a long drive to the office, and then you get there and you get beat up all day. <laughs> yeah, kind of untrue. Everybody's not a real stunt person, right? So there's yeah. no pull the punch. It's all lay the punch. It's, it's uh, all yeah. lay the punch. A lot of, drive, a lot of blood and. A little woozy, but you know. Yeah. So uh, this this movie again, Cosmic Radio, is really something I know that's uh, special to you guys. And uh, it, somebody had asked earlier. I think you guys had uh, touched upon it as far as what the hopes are. I mean, a lot of people are looking for things. At least I know I am too. That have a nostalgic feel to them. Because things have been so crazy and there's so much reality in our faces with the pandemic and just the realities of life that sometimes the retro stuff, the a lot of people watching the 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 classic movies, the comedies, the the Dick Van Dyke reruns, honeymooners, they're they're hearkening back for maybe a little bit more of a maybe a simpler time, but just things that seem grounded, that make you feel good, that put a smile on your face, but also get you to think. And this movie, as much as it's entertaining as well, it has a message. It really gets you to think. Tell us about that. Any one of you or all of you can take that. There's a message uh, as far as how we treat one another and as, as far as a society that goes along with all of the entertainment value of cosmic radio, right? I think, I think it really hits home today because the, the country seems so divided on so many levels that this is a movie about, you know, Jonathan's character has a big arc where he, he redeems himself because he's not the most, he's not the most responsible character when the movie starts. And he, he does a lot of growing up through this movie, but it's also just about compromise between the far right and the far left and how they can come together for the common good. And it, and it works on that level. Um, and it's funny thing about this movie being released now is that it's given me, I I'm shooting a movie now with Ann Archer that's been on hold because of COVID for 19 months, I think, but we're going to get started again in July and um, looking at Cosmic Radio now and the way it was put together, the way Ryan uh, set this up and lined it up has made me look at that movie now, at the new movie I'm shooting. And I've started thinking about different ways that I'm going to be telling that story now that, I've, that I'm going to be jumping back into and to this other film. And um, yeah, it's, it's for me, just, just the fact that the movie's out there has made me look at myself as a filmmaker who's been a little, I've gotten a little jaded over the years. I go back now and see Cosmic Radio and realize where I was, my first movie. And it's yeah. given me a new kind of perspective on things that I may have lost some of that that passion for filmmaking. I've, I've got it all back over the last week for sure. Um, <laughs> That is really, really cool. That's really, really fantastic. Um, I, I love all of this. And uh, David here says, uh, that is a wonderful thing about film. It allows for storyline to give moral wisdom to another generation. And that's a great observation, David. And that's so true, right? Even with something like Cosmic Radio. Yeah. I think that uh, the character Wes Studi... <laughs> has a lot of really good words of wisdom in, in cosmic radio, especially after I get beat up. He, he tells me you know, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the secrets of life and, you know, yeah. And, Wes, yeah. Wes is just, uh, he plays the mentor character or in other words, he's behind the scenes and all of this is going on. You're not sure how he feels about it, 
And it turns out in the movie that he's actually he's actually doing things in his own way instead of all the protests and beating over everybody over the head with their ideals. He's behind the scenes making things, making change. And nobody he's off everybody's radar. And I love that character. And Wes is such an intense actor that in this we actually get to see him smile and he, he kind of jokes. He, he's got a sense of humor. And uh, and he came up to me one time after we were shooting and he says, I this is the first time I played such a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's he, he, uh, he plays the uh, sheriff. He yeah. plays the sheriff. Yeah. And, he, uh, and David says, I can't wait to see the movie uh, as well. And we're going to tell you in a minute how you can see it all, gang. Um, any crazy moments on set? Any funny moments? Anything <laughs> that uh, every, I guess every, just, day. Uh, every day? Every day, every scene. On that one. Let, let's, yeah. ask, let's ask the producer that question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then you guys could follow in. Anything? Uh, that, oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, you, in, 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 okay, so it's this small town on top of a mountain, right? There's two ways out. It's an hour in either direction to get to anything else, right? So you're stuck up there, essentially. And it was uh, it was definitely summer camp for uh, marginally mature adults. And it was uh, madness. I mean, a, a crew, a, a movie is like a traveling circus, right? So it's like the circus was in town. Took over the town. I, I I don't think we were allowed to come back to about half the hotels in the town. But um, you know, but uh, we had a, we had a great time. We had everything from barroom brawls to uh, one of our crew members' uh, motorcycles exploding to falling out of helicopters, almost door wide. You know, it's like one thing after another in in a fun way. And uh, we had fun over the past couple of weeks here because it's it was a little while ago but it's like this walk down memory lane that we all had that was so much fun I, and uh i want to tell you something about ryan's magic so we didn't have the money for helicopter shots they weren't even going to be in the movie and this was the before drones were a big thing there were no drone crews out there no. readily available with real pro equipment and uh there was a forest fire that happened while we were shooting a major one in fact we, uh, Ryan and I decided to dedicate the movie to five firefighters who had died mm. fighting the fire, Asia, yeah. um, um, Engine 57. And at the end of the movie, that's the credit. Um, but anyway, there was a, a bunch of uh, guys up there clearing all the burnout. And it was a tough job. They were trying to get everything, uh, all these old dead trees off the mountain and everything, which fell right into our story. And we were drinking one night at the bar at this local bar and there was a guy in there and he was talking about his, he was the helicopter pilot who was pulling logs out of the forest. And Ryan just walked up to him and said, Hey, so what are the chances you could do helicopter shots for us? And he goes, sure. What do you need? And we got, we got uh, amazing forestry shots from this helicopter. And actually that helicopter became part of the story. And then Ryan decided well since we've gone that far we'll go hire a helicopter for a day and do more aerial so that was you know, again uh, uh just ryan adapting to the moment oh this guy let's buy him some beers and maybe he'll give us some helicopter shots wow. so, here's pretty good currency yeah yes <laughs> that always works how about you john uh any for the helicopter shots for yeah. <laughs> how about you uh john any crazy moments you recall there, there are a lot. There are a lot, um, mostly after filming, but it was just a wild, fun town. But there was a time that Wes Studi was behind me where I, I, I drive a Mustang, a red Mustang, and we were in a gravel driveway and he was up on a little porch behind me. And it was like the second take where I, I didn't, I guess, take off fast enough the first time. So they said, you know, really punch it and take off. So I, I punched it and just covered Wes with uh with stones with gravel and uh, he, he wasn't, wasn't so happy wasn't. <laughs> but we, we just had a lot of fun wow. yeah it's cool it stuff it. yeah it was, it was just a fun experience and now it's all coming back to our memories like ryan said it's like a you know it's like staggering down memory lane but yeah. all all good memories i don't have a single bad memory about that you know another notable uh cast member was uh taboo was in oh, yes. uh, from the Black, Black Eyed Peas. Yes. And he's just a class act, really cool guy, so much energy, 
so professional. And uh, he played my assistant at the radio station. And uh, he was he was really cool. So, I'll tell you, this is something for independent filmmakers looking to make a movie with bigger names. Taboo did that movie because it was something he'd never done. He'd done some karate movies. He does action stuff, and he always played the evil guy. And we came to him and said, "Hey, you're this guy who saves a radio station." Yeah, um, you know, and he he looks so great that look on screen. He's got the you know he had the long hair then, and uh, Black Eyed Peas were huge. He didn't have to do a movie like this, but we, I had written something that was really hit him hit home with him that he got to play again like a Wes. He got to play a nice guy for once instead of Magua or you know. The, <laughs> Street Fighter guy. And if you're yeah. making a movie and you want to get uh, a big name actor for, for really inexpensive, for cheap, want them to be in your movie, if you don't need them for too long to take to cut into their schedule, but mostly if you just write them a character they've never done before. Um, I did a, a pilot, a Western pilot, and uh, I got Wolfgang Bodison from A Few Good Men. He played the young black uh, Marine who Tom Cruise is defending in A Few Good Men. Yeah. And, ever done a western so i went up to him and i say hey, i got a western with this this character in it this cool black cowboy rancher and he goes dude i'm in he didn't even read the script he just uh, knew he could ride horses and shoot guns and he was in so that's the that's the trick i think that is incredible really you know also too um this is uh academy award nominated seymour castle's last film um Anything you'd like to uh, say about Seymour to our viewers and what it was like working with Seymour and the contributions being involved in this particular project? Yeah, I, Seymour was probably, for me as a filmmaker, the biggest learning experience. I like to work with some of the seasoned pros. I worked with um, uh, Jack Green, who's um, Clint Eastwood cinematographer. He did Unforgiven, Bridges of Madison County. I work with um, just a lot of guys that have been in the industry forever and have stories to tell. And I'm like a little kid. I follow them around and I ask them all these questions about other movies they've done. But uh, Seymour was so giving of his time. He was just he was just there. Even on days he didn't have to be there, he'd show up smoking his cigar and he'd call me over in between uh, takes and he'd just say, hey, how's it going? How's how's everything going? Because he knew it was my first real movie and and that kind of stuff. You just I mean, I studied that New York uh, new wave uh, independent filmmaking with uh, that Cassavetes had started in New York in the late 60s into the 70s. And Seymour was such a big part of that. And I was that was a, a, a genre that that New York East Coast film thing. I studied it a lot. And so to be able to get advice from Seymour was a big thing, but a guy like him didn't just show up, collect his pay and go home. He was actually there to make sure that we made a really cool movie. And I'm proud of the fact, I'm sorry, Seymour's gone, but I'm, I'm actually proud of the fact that I was the last director that he worked with and he showed me so much respect and um, yeah, it was just, great and i'll say the same about michael madsen big star i mean huge star but michael showed me so much respect he didn't he could have just run over me you know and it was funny because i think it was ryan who told me i hadn't met michael yet and ryan came up to me and goes he smells fear <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, he's just gonna walk all over you so the first night i met michael um i walked up to he was he showed up in this black suv and one of his one of his entourage came out and said, "Yeah, Mr. Madsen wants to talk to you." And I said, "Well, I'm, I'm just getting ready to shoot. I'll be up there in a minute." And so I saw the back door open of the SUV, and I saw that famous black pair of boots he always wears, right? And uh, so after we did the take, I walked up to him, but instead of standing there so that Michael would be above me and I'd listen to his little introduction, I walked around the other side and got in the other side and shut the door. <laughs> and look, man. Eh, you can do two things. You can just treat me like crap and, or you can be the movie star that you are. And I'm going to treat you with so much respect because I am just so thrilled and honored that you're here to work with me. And he looked at me through all the cigarette smoke and he said, so this dog walks into a pet store and he tells a joke and then he taps me on the knee and he goes, it's going to be fine. I'll see you tomorrow. And that was it. That was, that was my introduction to Michael Madsen. So, yeah. 
grateful to Ryan because, because he just said, hey, man, you better step up because this dude is here to, he's, he's a serious <laughs> guy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, how about you, Ryan, uh, as well, far I'll as. Say, and I'll say Seymour, uh, I got to give him a little bit of credit um, from beyond the grave might have kicked all this off. I was at his funeral and ran into the, the family and it's like, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm Ryan. We did a movie. You know what? I'll make you a promise. We're going to release this great movie that we did. The Seymour is so fantastic in. And that's kind of what, when we started. So we, Seymour, who's a, who's a, a, you know, a little, a little gruff. He may have given us a little kick in the rear end from the grave. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is very funny. That's a great memory. How about you, uh, John, working with him? I really just, it was just relaxing working with him because he is so uh, experienced. So he just kind of put everything at ease and, you know, pretty much all eyes are on him too. So he plays my father. So I'm lucky to have some nice scenes with him. Um, and uh, yeah, he just, but he has, en he had energy. And that's yeah. the thing about it. He was like a big kid in a way, like he yeah. had this gruff personality and I guess, but like he smoked a cigar, but there was like a, like he's laughing at the same time and he just was cool. Yeah. So, uh, I really enjoyed being around him. And like Steven said, you just learn just by just watching him. You know, everyone is just, there's something special about him. He added this great bit yeah. to the movie. There's a party scene and he was through the whole movie. He's got a cigar in his mouth. That's just Seymour. But he added this bit with Irene Bedard where he hands her a cigar and he goes, oh, yeah. Don't even tell the director, just smoke it. And so she took it <laughs> ad lib this whole thing. And Jonathan goes, Where'd you get that cigar? And then she starts smoking it. She lights it on. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's Would one of say? the funniest, the funnier lines in the movie, too, because she says something kind of funny. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, great. it's not like I've never smoked a guitar before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Was he anything like George Burns and his cigar at all? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Speak of legends with their cigars, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. So, you, you, usually, when I show this, people are like, "What the heck? How'd you get you, that?" You always bring that out. Is it, yeah, how did you get that? Yeah, I, I do, and it surprised everybody. This was a uh, this actually it was my aunt Lillian's, one of my mother's sisters. She collected dolls, and it got passed down to me. And you know, he's in full garb and everything, and. It, uh, right. it's a collectible thing, and it came out when he turned 100. Uh, yeah. so we we pop it in, and uh, you mentioned the cigars, so that was a yeah. perfect lead in to Georgie, yeah, <laughs> George yeah. Burns. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we didn't answer the whole question, but somebody had asked where we are taking where we hope to go with the movie, and right. I'd like to ask Brian that myself. Brian, what do you think? And overall, what do you think is the best case scenario for what happens with Cosmic Radio now that well, it's my it would be my hope that it just gets out there and reverberates into into uh, pop culture a little bit, where it gets compared to like what um, I feel like it's a little sidewaysy, and you know, like to me, if sideways is on, I stop what I'm doing, I'm watching it, right? It's like I hope it becomes that movie out there, and you know, it's on enough formats that it's going to catch the audience one way or another. So it's like. The movie will speak for itself to them, whether or not they're watching it. But it is my hope that that's all the places. Too. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, the 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 vibe and the 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 buzz of this movie has been going on for years. And I don't know how many websites they've been on where they've been talking about independent film. And that movie came up, and, and people, I think on IMDb, I was reading this thing where somebody said, "Does anyone know what happened to this movie?" I mean, a lot of Michael Madsen fans and a lot of Taboo fans they are going, "What?" Well, where is this? You know, I'd like to see this movie. And um, the I think one of the biggest um, one of the biggest uh, learning experiences I had was some st what Ryan taught me going through the film festival process. So we got a festival licensing for music, and we had Elton John, Dolly Parton, Peter Gabriel, <laughs> and, and it was the festival music soundtrack was amazing. And he came up to me, he goes, "Don't fall in love with it." And I go, "What? Yeah, gonna be some changes." <laughs> this is this all these songs will be gone when we distribute this movie. I was heartbroken as I got so used to it, but I learned a lesson. Yeah, don't don't fall in love with big time songs and. and because they, they, a lot of times they don't end up in the movie. However, Ryan called me um, a while back and said, you know a lot of independent 
music artists start putting together the soundtrack and throwing songs into these places to replace these song these famous songs and we put together i just i was on cd baby i was on youtube i was just looking for independent artists music artists who just had great feel and vibe and the soundtrack we put together is pretty phenomenal plus um Tabu has a song on it and uh Lindsay Price has two songs on it. She's a great actress, beautiful girl and a really good uh recording artist. So yeah, I'm really happy with uh with the soundtrack. Somebody Didn't... had uh asked uh and I guess this is a question that could be for all of you. Originally uh Maddie had uh addressed it to Stephen, but maybe all of you. Is there anything you would have done differently while shooting Cosmic Radio? Anything you would have in hindsight done differently or is it perfect the way it is no it's just i was too new a filmmaker to really even think about that maddie it's a it just it's i look back on it now and i'm just so grateful that i was given the tools that i was to make my first movie maybe one or two percent of filmmakers their first film is that and not only that i was pleasantly surprised to see that that's my director's edit that it was released and Ryan said, well, we may be cutting into it, but maybe not, you know. And so I saw somewhere that it was listed at 90 minutes and I went, oh, they cut a lot out. But then mm -hmm. I saw the release and it was it was exactly my my edit, which was amazing. So they not only gave me an opportunity to direct a movie that with a great cast, they also let me have the the uh, director's cut. That never happens. That just never happens at all. Um, and I'm just just I just think it's a uh, it's Ryan and uh, and Jonathan and and other producers their faith in what I was doing and and what I like most left me alone. You're, it's your movie. You shoot it. If you uh, if you shoot yourself in the foot, you shoot yourself in the foot. But otherwise, we're not going to bother you. And they just let me do what I did, and um, that was the most freeing thing. I didn't. Nobody was over my shoulder telling me I was screwing up. I did. Ryan did tell me we were shooting Michael Madsen in the middle of the night one time, and we were shooting film, like we said, and we were rolling out a film. And Tarina Reed, the director of photography, said, we won't have enough film for tomorrow if we keep shooting. And so <laughs> I went to Ryan. Tarina says, we're, we're running out of film. He goes, why are you worried about that? We'll send somebody to L.A. We'll get more film. Just go work. <laughs> Your job. <laughs> I need to stop worrying about all, all this little crap. They'll take care of it. It's just, yeah. It was really nice. It was, I mean, I, the experience was re it helped me learn quick. Yes. When I moved on to my next feature film, um, I had the confidence to walk on set and really, and, and really control the environment of the set. Yeah. yeah. Which is cool. Which yeah. is great. Yeah. Which is great. Now it's, uh, we were showing a graphic so people can get a good idea that it's uh, available at a lot of different locations, right? Apple TV, Prime Video streaming right now, Voodoo, Hoopla, Tubi. It's all streaming. You can see it at all these great locations, everybody. Cosmic Radio, again, see it on your screen there. Apple TV, Prime Video, that's Amazon Prime, of course, Voodoo, Fandango, Tubi, Hoopla see it at all those great uh, locations. Now, a lot of times, you know, when there is something that is uh, released or re-released, there is, uh, you know, the whole red carpet thing and premieres and all of that. Has there been any of that kind of thing with this? Or it's just, it's the new world of just getting it out there and streaming it and sort of. I think, I think we're all just ready to let it speak for itself at this time. You know, we did all the red carpet stuff when we when we finished it. When did, you first did it, yeah. And it's a it, it's not a good time for premieres and stuff yeah. like that. No, yeah, premieres no. will play it flat out. Do not have any public screenings, nothing, because everybody, you know, it, COVID's out of control, and you don't want to say, "Hey, the, from the premiere, everybody got COVID." <laughs> right, <laughs> that's happened quite a bit. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But I just my last thing I'll say is that uh, Jonathan and Ryan have been. They just believed in me right off the bat you know jonathan was he wasn't a full actual on the on the spot producer as an actor he needed to, to take he needed to worry about his character but well once the movie was filmed i think uh, jonathan had a big role in, in trying to get things get it back on track to where it would release but i think ryan deserves 99 percent of the credit for making this thing happen it's out now. It's my first movie, and I can actually people say, "Oh, where can we see that?" Oh, I think it's on Amazon right now. I have another film right now that released three weeks before this um, called 
called Vertical. On it's on streaming on the Roku channel, and I think it's going to move over to Amazon Prime. And I like it. I'm very proud of that movie. But Cosmic will always be the movie. That, you know, it's your first, your first child is always. The yes, is always the right. Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, what would we'll do a little round robin here? I mean, you got uh, John is is so moved by the movie and our conversation, he's all choked up about it. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a little yeah, round bringing robin. back memories, right? Bringing back <laughs> memories. Um, start with you, Stephen. Um, what would be one thing that you got that you hope uh, audiences are left with when they, whether it's a message, a feeling, all of the above? after they watch Cosmic Radio? All I hope is people see it for what it is. It's a cute, adorable little movie that it's, I wouldn't say it's family friendly because Mike Madsen threw a whole lot of F-bombs on there that we weren't really ready for. Um, but but um, Michael is amazing. But I think what um, what people will take away from this is that it's just a really it's just a, uh, an adorable little movie that has a message to it. And at the end, it, it does bring up some tears because uh, Jonathan's character reunites or, or gets acquainted with his 13 year old daughter. They've been completely estranged. And that kid, Lauren Gray, just Lauren Gregg just did such a great job. And she's so such a good little actor. Oh, she's adult now, but um, she, uh, she, he kind of drives the movie into a place where people will watch it and say, uh, it's kind of a pseudo cool little retro family slash uh, message film. I'm hoping that's what people get out of it. Cool. How about you, Ryan? What do you hope people are left with? Well, I hope and for your audience and everything, I, I, it, we see it when you can. Um, please comment. Let us know what you think of it. If you don't like it, you don't have to let us know. But, you know, <laughs> you're going to love it. Please comment. Give us the like thing. Give us the, a rating. Um, chime in onto it. We really appreciate it. And uh, and hopefully that you do like it, you tell somebody else to watch it. That, you know, that's that's what we're trying to do is get a little bit to let people know that it's out there and, and, and build an audience and hopefully it deserves it. Uh, you guys be the judge of it. Um, and John? Well, I, think, I think it's... You know, it's, I think we're fortunate because it did take so long for it to come out. So I think the timing now is it does have that nostalgia element to it. Right. And you see the eight tracks in the studio. You see the vinyl. And, you know, I think people have come so far because, you know, back then it may have not been such a, uh, you know, a distance from technology. But now that everything is so technical and you've yeah. lost that connection to you know, to nature, the things that are important. So I think the nostalgia element to the, to the movie really rings true now and just has that feel good element. So I'm really happy that it's, that for whatever reason it was held back. And I think it just, it's maybe that, that cosmic thing, but it's, right. it's nice that it's out now and uh, it's, it's fun to watch. Yeah. A divine intervention or something happened to have it released yeah. now during the the pandemic where people yeah, you never know it sometimes and... it, things take their course and we're just really lucky and and it's talk you know i was you know hired as i was an actor in it and then after it got into post i got a little bit more involved because then i started producing more things after cosmic but you know just i learned so much from ryan just because he's always like he's just you know, there's always fires erupting, you know, and yeah. he just puts them out and puts them out and keeps moving and keeps moving. And, and working with Stephen Savage was awesome. And, it, you know, so I just learned so much on that experience that I've taken on um, beyond, you know, Cosmic Radio. But I, I love watching it now. And, uh, you know, there's there's obviously things that you would do differently on any film you work on. But uh, it, I think also, you know, Ryder Strong's in there from Boy Meets World. Mm -hmm. He's, he does a really nice job. Kevin Gage, who's awesome in it. Kevin Gage was in Heat, played Wangro in Heat, and he was on in Con Air and a lot of big movies. So. Oh yeah, sure. Just really good, good people. Incredible group. It. Yes. I, I, I got to tip my hat to Ryan for what he did, and and to Stephen. Really, really, and we've 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 stayed friends since. So not only was it nice to be able to be in a film, which is, you know. A, and like one of those checks boxes you have to be able to star in a movie. It's like, wow, I mean, I'm very lucky that that happened. But yeah. To actually meet, you know, make friends that you have for a lifetime is, uh, 
even more important. So, yeah, very fortunate, very lucky. The uh, the locals grabbed onto it too while we were shooting all the extras and everybody. But we also cast just us, right off the top of our heads. We created two characters for two um, mentally disabled people who live in Idlewild. Um, and we gave them roles, and they shine. They just shine in it. I don't know what, yeah. it was, but that, but uh, they do a, a kid named Paul Hamilton, who's um, who's just such a sweet guy, you know. But he's he's mentally challenged, and we were wondering how he would act on a big set, and he did a great job. He had such a good time, and um, and then there was another guy named Tim Millett who was also in the. He's also um, just somebody from childhood who's had mental uh, disabilities and and he he plays one of the DJs and he's just funny. It's just when he hits the screen, he's just a, he just smiles and does this thing. And the way he the way Jonathan interacts with him is, is he's so fresh and normal and there's no problem. And Jonathan's the guy with all the whole world on his shoulders. And I think the Tim Tim's character brings Jonathan kind of to a place where he goes, Things could be worse. If this guy can be happy, I should be happy. What am I bitching about? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Providing opportunities like that. That is really a beautiful thing to do. You guys are amazing. This is really exciting. And congratulations. I know it's been a long time coming to have it uh, you know, distributed in this way. And we want to remind everybody again, here you've got on your screen there, Apple TV, Amazon Prime Video, Voodoo, Fandango, Hoopla, Tubi. You can see uh, Cosmic Radio and just sit back and uh, enjoy and have a really, really good time. And I know you guys are really excited about it and kudos to all of you. It sounded like it was really, you know, a lot of fun putting it together and uh, all shot on film uh, rated PG 13 Academy award nominee Seymour Castle in it as well. Michael Hudson and an incredible crew put this together and amazing actors and actresses and uh, really a pleasure to have you guys on. And I hope we all stay in touch. I'd like to have, uh, you know, you guys uh, collectively or individually back on the show as my guest, it would be uh a pleasure and I hope you spread the word about uh, what we're doing here at the gym masters show live. Sort of bringing back the lost art of conversation. It was cool having you all join us today. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Jim. Thank you. Absolutely. Pleasure. If we were all in the same zip code, I say we go out for a beer or something, but you got yeah. ones in uh, Cape May, New Jersey, Idlewild, California. And Ryan, you are right now. Marina Del Rey, California. Beautiful spot, and I'm here in the Northeast as well. So, you guys, uh, be well. Thanks for all uh, you know the great uh, commentary, the wit and wisdom. Just want to show you some of the uh, lovely action here coming in from the viewers. Who are going to run out and make sure they stream. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Congratulations on the movie! Can't wait to watch it. That's one of our uh, regular lovely viewers, Sherry Larson in yeah. Kansas. Kathleen thank in New York City, uh, thanks for being here with us, guys. Good luck with everything. Juanita, thanks, watching Kathleen. South thank Africa, you. Juanita, great wow. conversation. Thank you, guys, for spending time with us. Congratulations and good luck. Wow. And, Beautiful uh, South Africa. And Merlin in Canada, sure love your respect for him. And I think you guys are talking about Simon uh, as well. Cool stuff. You guys are really good. And... Uh, I hear and love your guests. Thank you, Jen Barry oh, in Pennsylvania. Thanks, Jen. You guys uh, were fantastic. It was really uh, a really cool opportunity to welcome you to the show. We'll keep the porch light on for you, and I hope the show met whatever expectations uh, you guys had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I have with you. Thanks, Absolutely. Thank you. All See right. you, Jen. Thank Take you. care, Stephen and Jonathan and Ryan. Good luck with everything, and we'll see you again soon, okay? Good. All right. Take care. Right. Bye -bye. All right. Take care. Cheers. All right, gang. Wow. Cool. Let me show you again where you can stream this movie because I know you guys are going to want to see it. It's available right now. Cosmic Radio now streaming at Apple TV, Prime Video, Voodoo Fandango, Hoopla, and Tubi as well. We get Tubi. We're going to check it out on Tubi. And really, 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 really cool. We love it. We love it. And, um, uh, you're going to love this. So check that out. It was really great to have. Again, actor uh, Jonathan Sakar here, producer Ryan R. Johnson, writer-director Stephen Savage, 
all from the movie Cosmic Radio. That was really, really cool. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, gang. We would love that. Always great when you guys do that. That's the uh, channel you're watching right now. And uh, we'll be back. We have another guest that's coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern. For those of you that are watching live, we have Grammy and Emmy nominated jazz guitarist, also from the uh, David Becker Tribune. We're talking about David Becker himself joining us live. He's going to perform live. That's 7 p.m. Eastern and uh, 4 p.m. Pacific coming up today. For those of you who are watching uh, live. And then tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern, we have actress, dancer, and NFL cheerleader, Jessica Stellin is joining us. She's all excited. And she's in a brand new Hulu film that is based on the lives of uh, Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee. And she's starring in that. She'll be with us uh, tomorrow as well. Again, we thank uh, some of the gang from Cosmic Radio for joining us. And we'll be back. And uh, Merlin says, really nice to meet all you guys. Good to see you as well, Merlin. And uh, Sherry, thank you very much. And Kathleen and Jane and Gary and everybody. We'll see you guys soon if you're with us for our second show today. Again, we've done about 600 episodes here on our uh, YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We would absolutely love that game. All right, you guys take care and be well. I'm your host, Jim Masters. Thank you for your time this time till next time right here on our fantastic show where we're bringing back the lost art of conversation. This is the Jim Masters Show Live. We'll see you again soon. You guys take care and be well. Thanks for being with us. We love it. We'll keep the porch light on for you and you and you and you as well. Take care. Cheers.